Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Friday and welcome to Tennessee Women in Green. We're so happy to see you here and we're happy to see the folks that are joining us virtually. We've got a great program this morning, so we're going to dive right in. I'm going to turn it over to Jen Tribble, our treasurer and program coordinator for today, <laughs> um, who's going to introduce our guests. Um, thanks, Elaine. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be joined by some of my favorite TNET colleagues this morning. Uh, we have Deputy Director of Operations Paula Mitchell with the TDAC Division of Water Resources. She received a BS in Marine Science from Coastal Carolina University and a Certificate in Executive Leadership from TSU. She spent 18 years working in TDEC's recycling and waste reduction programs, providing technical and financial assistance to counties and cities and connecting industry with public services. She's been deputy director for four years and is responsible for a whole host of things, including overseeing non-permitting programs such as grants and budget, compliance and enforcement, drinking water, human resources, state revolving fund, and the new state water infrastructure grants program. A lot is a lot. Um, we also have Nina Jones. She is the state water infrastructure grants program manager. She received a BS in geology and hydrology from the University of Arizona and an MS in geology right here at Vanderbilt. She spent eight years working for a regional water conservation nonprofit, the Cumberland River Compact, before landing at TDEC for the past 12 years. While at TDEC, Fina has spent her time in the Division of Water Resources, first focusing on restructuring the state's assessment of impacts to aquatic resources and redesign of the compensatory mitigation program. For the past three years, she has been transitioned into water infrastructure funding assistance programs helping utilities, cities, and counties comply with elements of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act. She is currently working with a team to deploy $1 billion in stimulus funding to cities and counties across the state for their most critical water infrastructure needs. So this morning is gonna be a little bit different. Um, rather than doing a presentation, we're just gonna do kind of informal question and answer interview style. So, um, We'll have time for some Q&A at the end. So for those of you online, feel free to put your questions into the chat. And for those of you in person, we can just take Q&A live when we get there. So to kick us off, can you just give a quick introduction to, of yourself to the group, including your current role and responsibilities in your position? So, so I think you did a good job on like giving us an introduction for me. And so right now I'm managing the state water infrastructure grants program. We are applying one billion dollars worth of stimulus money to um, counties and cities across the state. We have um, about 990 million dollars worth of worth of requests so far and that money is being used to address critical needs of drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater utilities. Um, I am the Deputy Director of Water Resources. Um, my focus is on ensuring helping the division, um, I guess, uh, um, I started in my mid 20s in the community assistant and um, worked as an entry level scientist and kind of moved my way through. Um, various uh, solid waste assistance programs, also providing financial assistance to local governments and communities. And um, that experience helped prepare me for helping to transition into water resources and getting to work with right people like me mm -hmm. and Aaron, who's in the audience today, up here. Um, Anna Sarders, who I have online today, um, and working just with a lot of different folks within water resources, implementing the programs that they're the ones who like do all the great work. And I just feel like I remove the barriers, clear the path for them. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. And I'm sorry, we're hearing that the sound is not working online. So we're trying to get this figured out. <clears throat> Can y'all hear, is this better online? Yes, that's louder. Okay, we may just need to kind of talk straight into the microphone because it's getting picked up through my computer. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, okay, so 
The next question is, uh, where did you grow up? Where are you from? And <laughs> did you have any formative experiences throughout your childhood and your education that led you to pursue your career in the environmental field? Uh, I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, which is the southwestern most corner of Arizona where Yuma uh, is between Mexico and California. It's a long border. So if you look at any new areas lately, or you know, you'll know that water issues in Arizona are critical um, and uh, really drive, you know, of that state. So yeah, as a young child, I grew up in the desert, water was super important, and of course that really helped form some of my most important, uh, you know, some of my drive to work in the water industry for sure. Grew up in um, the south of Nashville in Brentwood, Tennessee, born and raised there. I went to Scales, North, north Side Middle School, and Brentwood High School. Um, and then I spent a lot of my days um, playing in the backyard creek with my best friend who lived across the creek. Um, we went on an adventure in the backyard and next door to us. It really was just a cattle farm, a wooded cattle farm. Um, but we explored those woods, and I just spent really, I guess, as a child being outside. Um, my dad was a bass fisherman, I spent a lot of time going fishing with him. And so I think it was just my um, desire and love to be sports that really led me to want to pursue an education in marine science. I was all about getting out of Nashville and going to the beach. And so I did that for a few years and, and enjoyed that and then missed my family back in Middle Tennessee. And that's what brought me back to Nashville. Well, <laughs> So when when I was in graduate school at Vanderbilt, I'm one you know the first uh, person in my family to go to college and didn't really know what college was, got to college, realized graduate school was another step, ended up at Vanderbilt. And a lot of my um, peers were doing graduate work in really uh, glamorous places like Antarctica or um, Bangladesh. Um, and I thought that was interesting, but I was always really interested in what does it mean for my backyard? So I, you know, asked my advisors, well, can we do something about graduate studies here, water here in Middle Tennessee. And I ended up in the Mill Creek watershed. Um, and there I met uh, John McFadden and I met uh, <laughs> all y'all in the Cumberland River Compact and realized that there was an actual opportunity to work to do preservation, conservation and really educate and build um, partnerships to understand how we can do a better job of addressing resources in our backyard. So um, with that, I got an opportunity at the Cumberland River Compact where I learned how to work with um, state and local leaders to talk about things like stormwater and understand how cooperative um, processes can help drive, you know, policies and practices. Once I ended up at the uh, Division of Water Resources, I spent a lot of time in permitting. And um, once, you know, at the permitting, in the permitting unit, we worked a lot again with collaboration, which is a, a one of the only ways you can get permits through that are really impactful, but also help address minimizing those impacts to water quality. So that's kind of led me to this place. I took an opportunity to say, great, I've done a lot for water resource impact work um, at the stream. How, how can we convert that to looking at uh, the uses of those for drinking water and wastewater, for example, and took an opportunity in the state revolving fund. And then um, when the stimulus opportunity came around, really just uh, capitalizing on um, just capitalizing on that opportunity when it arrived. So my first 
job out of college was actually at the Cumberland Science Museum. Um, I was an educator there and, and got some experience doing, you know, education and outreach. I worked with students that um, did lock-ins at the Science Museum, and I, I did educational programs, and I spent the night with them, and then I got a job. Um, Y'all may have remembered, those of you that have been around for a while, the Science Cumberland Science Museum um, got a new CEO and it changed the Adventure Science Center. That's what it is today. And that's when they let me go. <laughs> they let me go. They're like, sorry, we're downsizing. Um, but they um, they put me on a really good path to, to getting some skills that I needed to move into the professional world. And, and that's when I got hired at TDEC. And um, then I went back to the Science Museum and said, you don't have anyone to sleep over with these students. I'll still do that for you. Um, but I think like that was kind of my start in education and outreach kind of programs. And then the experience I got working in solid waste assistance, designing um, financial assistance programs, grant programs to help local governments with recycling and solid waste collection, as well as um, being given the opportunity to implement the 10-year solid waste and materials management plan. Um, implementing a long-term plan with many objectives, strategies, and tactics was a really useful experience in working with local stakeholders or um, the industry and whatnot to, to understand how it takes a shared responsibility to implement some of these programs and initiatives. And so I got a lot of experience working with various stakeholders and, and getting to understand what their issues were and, and then trying to implement programs that would be complementary to supporting those. And so I think that helped me make a transition into water and doing the programs that I do now. Mm -hmm. awesome. So we've heard a bit about your story, your background, and where you're from. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what you're working on right now. So the yeah. State Water Infrastructure Grants Program. Uh, we mentioned, you know, $1 billion going out to cities and counties to do work. Can you talk just a little bit more about what sort of work they're going to be doing and what lasting impact this may leave on Tennessee's water infrastructure? Sure hopefully lasting impact, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> previous to uh, the State Water Infrastructure Grants Program, I had worked to help redesign assessment methodologies for impacts to streams and, and worked on something called the stream quantification tool. Um, that tool and I, really can I call you back on to on like, multitasking? Um, build partnerships and understand. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, I'll call you in Building hour. components that help focus people okay. on what is like the most critical. Okay. So there was an opportunity to design something called the infrastructure, Tennessee infrastructure scorecard. And we took conceptually the um, model for the stream tool and applied it to what are the most critical components of a water, a drinking water or a wastewater or stormwater utility system, including um, plans, uh, the facilities capacity, how old it is, all, all kinds of, is it losing water? Is it financially stable? Looking at the technical, managerial, and financial general components. We took that tool and said, how can we apply it to this $1 billion opportunity? And it's with that, we have allowed um, entities to quickly review their system, technically, managerially, financially, whether or not they um, are uh, having appropriate rates uh, to pay for their system, whether or not they're losing a ton of water that they've already treated through their aging lines, um, or whether or not they're meeting state mandated compliance issues. And um, having that as the entry point for this $1 billion saying, okay, let's see what your critical needs are, everybody. Come in the door, do the tool, and identify red flags. And that has led to a significant amount of addressing things like water loss, which helps water supply issues, leaky pipes, um, inflow and infiltration, which means groundwater and stormwater get into our wastewater lines and creates capacity issues, overflow into the environment. So the lasting impact or the what folks will be doing once they get started with their projects in the next couple of months will be whole scale um, 
renovation, really renewing, rehabilitating a lot of existing parts of their facilities across like 300, maybe 400 different systems um, for the entire state, right, on a, on a base level, which is phenomenal. Um, and then everybody will also be making sure they have um, appropriate asset management plans, which is making sure all your facilities are mapped, your lines are mapped, you understand what the conditions are and how to repair them over time. 70, 76% of our systems in the state don't have adequate mapping just of their lines themselves, which can be a really significant issue when you think about inclement weather events. Your pipes freeze, the pipes bust, you don't even know where the pipes are, but you know people in the neighborhood are losing pressure. Um, you need to make repairs, you don't know where your lines are, how do you actually get that done? So it costs us inevitably more money and time and resources to hunt for these um, things and make a plan to replace them. And that really affects the level of service that you and I receive every day. Right? It's all about making sure that we can turn on the faucet, have some good safe drinking water, um, and be able to use the restroom and take a shower and have that water go somewhere we know that is not immediately overflowing into a stream. I'll just say, yeah, what Vina said, um, the th you know, I think internally, right? Like how is the division prepared to like help implement these programs? And so while she's busy, implementing this with with the grant recipients that are going to be putting this infrastructure on the ground and doing these projects i'm thinking about the bipartisan infrastructure law money the infrastructure investment and jobs act vil money that we are also eligible to receive and thinking about all right how do we build out a team and a program that can now administer those funds in a very innovative and creative way such that it, it's helping to meet the local needs, but also helping to move the needle on some of the federal and state goals and priorities as well. And just to kind of add on to that, all, all of this funding is super important. And a lot of times we see systems come in and don't really understand how to um, maximize leverage or even direct some kind of funding, funding like bipartisan infrastructure law funding or or stimulus funding. So developing programs that help, that really helps um, communities understand how they can make the best decisions with available funding for the long term is, is really what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you can expand on that because a billion is a lot of money, but it's a one time infusion, right? So, can you talk a little bit about what our anticipated need is across the state to address some of our water infrastructure challenges? And then, what other funding sources are out there to provide sustainable funding for these? Sure. Like the total overall need, Jen. I think you and Paula recite this all the time. I I actually don't I actually don't recall because I'm always like in the now. Fifteen billion dollars over the next yeah through 2040. It's a lot. Um, Fifteen billion dollars through 2040. It's and and frankly, it could even be more. Um, and you know, when, when we received the opportunity to do 1.35 billion, some with this $1 billion deployment of grants across the state, and then additional funding to do things like regionalization, um, reuse, and resource protection, uh, we heard a lot of people say, it's gonna be generational change. And I'm like, well, maybe, but the fact that these small communities are getting $750,000, doesn't actually mean generational change. It means that you can have a really good start of understanding your most critical needs and make a plan to leverage that um, and access other funding assistance opportunities that the state has, or maybe um, other state programs like economic and community development. So we have the state revolving fund loan program. We frequently encourage, great, use your stimulus money to start. And then when you realize the scope, the really magnitude of the issues that you have, understand where you need to go um, and make a plan to either take out loans or look at additional um, funding assistance through bipartisan infrastructure law, maybe addressing your lead pipes or other issues and not make it a one 
um, a one time, this is gonna cure everything and then switch your attention to the next thing. Frequently, um, a lo local elected leaders occasionally have a hard time thinking beyond five years or beyond um, their election cycle. And, and um, drinking water is forever. You know, those people, Paul has, you know, lived in Middle Tennessee, all of us, for a very long time. That tap is going to continue to run. And so if we don't have that foresight to know that we need to be planning for the next 10 and 20 and 50 years, um, we'll never be able to meet the needs of, you know, of our citizenry. Sure. Yeah. Well, Paul, I have a question for you next. So, um, working in the government, we're given, you know, about a billion dollars to deploy. Operationally, what does that look like? So how do you build the program? How do you implement it? What are the operations behind that? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I might have to think about it in chronological order. I think um, our our initial approach to the to the 1.3 billion was to build a team with um, you, Jen, Karen Simo, Kendra Abakowitz was on the team early, um, thinking about how to convince the governor to set aside some of the state fiscal stimulus dollars for water infrastructure. We developed the water infrastructure investment plan. I knew that we needed folks within water resources that were passionate about this initiative because it was going to be a really heavy lift. And so that passion and drive is what gets you over those like most challenging times where you feel, are fe beginning to feel overwhelmed with things. And so I couldn't, like Vina was so interested all the time asking questions. What are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? So it was just natural for us to bring Vina onto the team to help with that. And we recognize needing to build out staff. We, we have a rather small team. The state water infrastructure grants team is started out as a team of three, right? right? And then we were like, that's not gonna be enough. <laughs> so um, we did, we did uh, secure two more positions to help with implementing, you know, the 375 plus grants that that y'all are reviewing and rolling out right now, and um, and then we've also been working internally with, um, like, for example, Erin McComas. She is DWR's data steward, and and needing help to build out a grant management system to just manage all of the applications, the documents, the procurement, the reimbursements, the contracts. We, we leaned on Erin a lot to help us with the IT solutions for that. Um, she also worked with Tennessee Association of Utility Districts and FINA and team to um, build out a database for the infrastructure scorecard data. So that's really important. Um, we meet routinely with our grants and contracts that support the agency. So that's outside of our division. We have a small team that administers all the grants and contracts within TDEC. We meet with them routinely to prepare them for the workflow that's coming their way. Um, we meet a lot with general counsel. Um, they review a lot of our documents, our contracts. They have been invaluable to helping us um, build out the right contracts um, in terms and conditions for those contracts, helping us make sure we comply with, you know, uniform guidance, the federal uniform guidance for, for these grants. So um, it, it takes uh, coordination with an, an understanding process, just understanding the organizational process and how to, how to work the system, I guess. <laughs> a lot of patience. <laughs> Paul, you mentioned the importance of passion for being a part of this project. And um, one of my favorite things about TDEC is just how mission driven the, the people are. So, can you talk a little bit about what your professional ethos is and how you kind of approach your passion and your work to be in front of you? My initial, like, Thing that comes to mind when I think about that is for me, less is more. Um, in my daily life, I like consuming less, um, 
teaching my children that having less sometimes is more gratifying than having too much. I used to always say, I don't want stuff in my house that I have to like dust, vacuum, clean. I, you know, I think about my space and how much I use. Do I have to heat and cool this space? Like less is more for me. Um, and, and I think about that in, in how I implement programs at work. Um, simple, it's like, let's keep it simple, right? We, we've got to manage these things in the long term. And so, I don't know, I, I go to that a lot. <laughs> Why are you working with me if you want to keep it simple? I mean, just well, I'm, I'm in a balance. Like I, you know, that's a continuum, right? We balance each other. It's so hard. I just don't know. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I'll, I'll tell you when I I um was required to take resource uh, resource geology in um uh, my undergrad. Um, and and I was an older I was an older you know non traditional student, but also really like you know um, had a lot of bright ideas and and was like oh how could how could we still have classes about mining like that's just horrible why would you want mining and and um, went to the class I think the first day and a gentleman named Spence Titley was the instructor there, the professor, and, and, and he would smoke in the, in the classroom, he would smoke a pipe, <laughs> right, and this was in the 90s, in the late 90s, and he was like, what, and I'm like, well, it, you know, you don't do this, University of Arizona, a huge university, and we're like, oh, mining, I mean, that's just so, this is terrible for the environment, he slammed down that pipe, and he said, did you go to the restroom today? Actually, it was a little more colorful. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Um, did you brush your teeth today? Did you drive your car? Um, and I'm like, yes, sir, yes, yes, I did all that. And he's like, well, well, if we didn't grow it, we mined it, right? So make sure you understand. You can have this perspective of ultra protection. You want to be a major environmentalist or whatever, but it's always at a balance. Mm -hmm. And so working here today, I, I, I always think about that balance, um, realizing that people still need to get in their car. We may not want all of the cars that we have, but we're certainly not going to eliminate all of those vehicles. Um, and, and the same goes with how we use, conserve, um, and you know, treat our water resources, whether it's coming out of the tap or it's going down the shower um, or whether we're kayaking down that creek. And, and I think that, so making sure that we're um, having a balance and, and um, just having an appropriate perspective um, and being patient, always being patient. <laughs> Can you talk about one recent career accomplishment, something maybe even small, but that you're just very proud of over the last year or two? And then one thing that you're really looking forward to accomplishing over the next year? I mean, yeah. Well, I think I'm proud that you asked for one, so I'm gonna pick one. I think that billion dollar grant program that we designed and are implementing, I'm really proud of that one. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that, obviously, and I'm also proud of the partnerships, because I think really that is how we're accomplishing anything, whether it, whether it be mitigation or, or, you know, water quality issues, drinking water, wastewater, it's, it's all about the partnerships that we build um, and making sure that we're listening um, to the folks that we're working with and around us um, to make these make all of these things work. All right, I have just one more question and then we'll open it up for people in the room or online. But my question is, what do you view as one of or some of Tennessee's biggest upcoming environmental challenges? And then how can the Tennessee Women in Green, the people in this room, be a part of helping with that challenge and, and working toward positive solutions? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I don't know. Um, what are some of our biggest challenges? I think um, encouraging our our 
applied folks, our implementers, to try something new. Uh, you know, I, I used to, when writing permits, I used to um, be really cheeky and tell the engineers, don't give me your college homework. You're 50 years old. This technology is something that was, you know, done a long time ago. Um, and, and some of that is still valid today, right? Even, even the things that we did a long time ago, there's some that really still have a lot of good value, but it is really um, thinking about our, our, our biggest environmental challenge is not trying something new and, and thinking that, you know, the only way to do it is the way we've always done it. Because if we continue to do that, we'll never make progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's a really good point. It's kind of related to what I think recently that I've been experiencing through my colleagues mostly is the challenge of, of like extreme weather in Tennessee and particularly flooding. Um, it's, it's almost like a moral obligation. Everyone feels it, right? Everyone feels hurt when they see our, our neighbors or our citizens suffering from these events. And and it's being able to implement better practices or best practices. Um, it's easy to implement regulatory programs. We have very clear boundaries of how to do that. It's those um, non-regulatory things, uh, the, the things that we don't regulate that I think are challenging for us because you have to use a different persuasive approach to getting to managing those. Any questions from people in the room? Like the lesson that you want to really say, I know here you were back to doing it the old way, the same way. Yeah, for those online, the question is um, if there are any lessons learned or challenges that we're able to successfully overcome that you want to share with the group. Uh, yeah, I think maybe Madison County. <laughs> I think maybe Madison County won't do the fifty-five culvert um, job that we were arguing about yesterday. It's, um, and that's really just saying it's an it's an everyday challenge. So the the lesson learned is every single day there's there's something new, there's something different. Um, I'm always surprised at 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 having to say every situation's unique. Um, and it depends. Um, and uh, just, you know, keeping pushing the boundaries, right? And of understanding, you know, somebody or some community or systems have always done it this way. So the lesson is really saying it's okay to keep pushing the boundaries. And it's also okay to say when or know when to say when. Um, um, so that you're in a compromised situation. Uh, know that every single step that you're able to kind of take, take forward is a step in the right direction. So do what's right. Um, always try and um, push those boundaries, but always compromise, I think, is, is some of the big lessons that I've learned in my life. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think incremental progress is a lesson. I had a manager that just says, we're just trying to make incremental progress, like just move the needle a little bit. And over time, it will really make a change. And so, yeah. I'm going to repeat the question. Do we have a lot of lead pipes and water systems? Um, I think I think uh, we just saw a report this week or last week that said there's probably seventy thousand um, lead pipes in Tennessee. Um, I, there, so there are some systems that have been doing incremental replacement and inventory and replacement of lead pipe service lines um, and and components um, for for years, um, and so. 
we know that we have led, but we also know that we're nowhere near some of the um, older communities across the nation that have really significant lead. Uh, and, and then we kind of look at development and say, okay, how many communities were really developed prior to 1980? 1970 and thinking about those are you know kind of sectioning off those are probably the areas that are um, susceptible to having more lead and and focusing on that so I don't think it's like intensely pervasive throughout the state but I do think there are some opportunities for us to really get the lead out in the next five years and we should know that the inventory is Yes, and and please apply for your lead service line inventory grants, which which will help us determine exactly how much lead we think is in the state. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I do know that lead service line is a priority right now at the federal level. So do you want to talk a little sure. bit about what's coming up? From sure. Yeah. sure. So Paula mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that it offered us a lot of additional funding for specific kind of actions. Over the next um, six months, the State Water Infrastructure Grants Program will be um, implementing lead service line inventory and planning grants so we can assist communities in ensuring that they have proper inventories for all of their systems across the whole state. We're anticipating that being accomplished through um, and probably complete by mid-summer of 2025, give folks an opportunity to um, really do a good job of a, an intense inventory. And that will help us really determine how much funding we need to deploy and what style we need to deploy that in in, in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Any efforts for rules to be the Yeah. 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 So the, the question was as we're moving through the process that we've been talking about, um, what sort of rules or policies are there around transparency from the utilities to their consumers for things like the infrastructure scorecard and the, the projects that they're working on? So we don't have any rules for the infrastructure scorecard transparency, which really helps identify broad critical needs. Of course, there is always that consumer confidence report that comes out that is required by rule for your drinking water systems. And you probably see the postcard or the insert in your metro water bill on a you know a semi-annual on a, on a semi-annual basis. We have heard from a lot of citizens and um, environmental groups that are really interested in seeing the infrastructure scorecard data. We're also really interested in, in seeing how to aggregate that data because we got 450 systems that filled out this intense model of all of this technical man managerial and financial um, information. It's a really great opportunity for us to say, what is the magnitude of water loss? across the whole state. Um, what is, you, you know, what is, how many of our facilities are over 50 years old across the entire state? Um, so we're hoping, um, first we gotta deploy the billion dollars and then um, hopefully over the next, you know, 12 months, we'll be able to get a, more transparency and get some of that information converted to a platform where we can put it online for people to see. And, and hopefully that'll be in some kind of GIS format also. So it can be really geographic specific. Um, we're always we're also really interested in, um, and I was a part of helping to build the ability to pay index, which is a it's an index of um, disadvantaged communities, right? So looking at how our rural and urban communities and their economic situation also relate to the resources, the water resources and facilities that they have. So understanding how this funding um, really helped address critical needs and kind of specific um, communities, uh, I think is also really interesting. So there's a lot of option, um, you know, opportunity we have to make more transparent, uh, information available to the public and also use that to help drive our policies and rules over the next, you know, five years or so. Do you want to add anything?
Yes. Um, a question online is what are the impacts to Tennessee and Tina if the Supreme Court redefines waters of the United States? So, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, so I think the most, um, the most prop, the most challenging component of that right now is wetlands, right? And, and how we view wetlands and whether there's a jurisdictional nexus and, and all of these things. So, so there is, um, in, in this, in the in the state of Tennessee, I believe we even have legislation that's moving uh, moving to the General Assembly now to pull back. And, and this is and this is not WOTUS. This is this is state waters, right? Um, pull back how we evaluate state waters and eliminate our opportunity to go a little beyond waters of the U.S. To protect those things like wetland flats, right, that don't have like an obvious direct connection to a navigable stream. So we're, we're really concerned about that. Um, and if it pulls back the definition of streams, you know, if it's ephemeral, intermittent, perennial, we we have a system in the state that is different, that does diverge from waters of the U.S. and that's a hydrologic determination. So just making sure that we're protective of that tool, what, what, where it can really have um, a, a substantial impact is the effects of requiring compensatory mitigation, right? So if the, if the US government or the Army Corps of Engineers says all of these features, you really no longer are required to provide compensatory mitigation when they build a Walmart or they put a of a highway on top of a stream or a wetland, you have to replace that resource um, or hopefully replace that resource with a like resource, right? Really improve it. Um, if we do that, we'll see that there will be thousands of linear feet of stream that are lost um, and, and, you know, many acres of wetlands that will never return. So, you know, I think it's critical that we keep our eyes on these things and understand how they can impact us um, and, and really change the way, you know, water work moves through our environment, which has a direct effect on the biology and all of that over time. Yeah, it's really powerful. Any other questions? We have time for one or two more. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So we talked about, you know, one of the biggest challenges for us is getting over the new and trying or getting over the old and trying yeah. new innovative methods. And what are some of the challenges to implementing that? Fear of the unknown, um, risk. You know, um, a lot of um, a lot of what we see are, are engineers, right? We need those engineers that design our solutions and they're predisposed to be averse to risk um, for good reason. So um, being able to walk out on a ledge and take a risk and know that if something does fail, it's not the end of the world. And it's an opportunity for us to learn about that failure to make the you know, make the choices we uh, take next time even better. So, uh, yeah, it, and and um, there's a whole bunch of, you know, grumpy people who get really <laughs> upset when you say, no, you can't do it. But, you know, be, be consistent and um, just, you know, kind of work to saying, don't give me your old homework. Give me the good new stuff. Yeah. Education, right? Patient, Education. patience. Yeah. Right. Any final questions? Hey, Jen, there is Are some questions on, on the chat. Some questions are coming from the Yeah, the question is if any of the grant funds are being used to track non revenue water. I think it's water yeah, yeah. So that's a like a that's a component of water loss. So when we have systems evaluate, you know, how much water they produce versus how much water they sell, we kind of break. We try and break that out into um, 
not just non-revenue water, but unaccounted for non-revenue water. We can account for some of our non-revenue water. Some of that is actually like fire state, fire departments, right? Who need to turn on the hydrants and make sure that their hydrants are working properly. So um, we, we try and um, focus in on what we deem as the most critical of that non-revenue water, which is the unaccounted for losses. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. I know firsthand how busy these two women are. So we just thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Can you give them a big round of applause. Uh, the Tennessee Women Agreement have a small gift for you. So this is a necklace with a Tennessee culture pearl. I'm sure you both know from being water people, but um, we have the fortune of actually having pearls grown within our state, and so wanted to pass along as well. Yes. I love Thank it. You. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. With that, I will move over to Elaine for our announcements. Thank you all. You know, when you have the question of how do you deploy a billion dollars effectively and efficiently, you engage some smart, passionate women. Uh, sorry, Julie. Let me back button to point out. Thank you both for, for being here. So we're going to go through some announcements. Do I just? Oh, okay. It's on my second. Thank you. <laughs> um, so first of all, welcome to Tennessee Women in Green. I'm Elaine Boyd, president for this year. And thank you to Bongo Java for the coffee. They sponsored that for us this year. Make sure you partake before you leave. We don't want to take that back with us. As always, we like to remind you of the mission, which is to empower, inspire, and connect women who are committed to environmental sustainability. Thank you, thank you for being here today. That helps us accomplish that mission every time you participate with us. Thank you to our sponsors. We could not do it without our sponsors. We have space up there, so we have room for more. If you or your organization would like to be included as our sponsor, please go to our website. We'd love to have you. Thank you to our new and renewing members in January. Is anybody here raise your hand online or in person if you're a new or renewing member? Yes. How many first time people here today? Awesome. That is fabulous. So please join us. We'd love to have you spread the word. Next time you come, bring somebody with you. Um, here's another way to support us. When you shop at Kroger, you can connect us as the uh, donor of choice for the community organization. So you go to their website and pick out Twig. We'd appreciate that support. We just want to point out a few community events that are upcoming. Of course, this is Black History Month, and so there are a lot of community events um, that are available through all the local media. We do want to mention specifically the Mayor Sustainability, Sustainability Advisory Committee, and I want to point out, I think she stuck her head back in her office, Jacqueline Matupi, who is the reason we are here. She is awesome, and she's on the committee. Um, so the photo contest ends the 15th. Please spread the word if you're interested. Also, the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Awards through TDEC. Those nominations are open. There are 10 different categories, individual and group categories. You can self-nominate. Please go to the website, nominate somebody, or spread the word about the uh, nominations being open. Also, there's a fourth annual Nashville Youth Climate Conference. The registration is open now. That's through Cumberland River Compact. You have to be in a, a student in a Nashville high school to participate. And then finally, the Weed Wrangle, which is March 4th. Um, there are several locations throughout the city. I think, Dodd, there's a connection through Lipscomb for one of the locations. So please go to the website and sign up to participate. We hope to have a lot of Twig participation in that. Be on the lookout in the email. We'll be uh, kind of sending out an email to survey folks about 
social events they're interested in us doing this year in 2023. And we'll also be soliciting for marketing and hospitality committee members. And we have a new website. Oh, thank you. It, it was such a process. We changed platforms, we changed design, and all the work was done by two TWIG members voluntarily. So big shout outs to Anna and Colson. I don't know if they're on today. We appreciate them so much. And last of all, thank you for spending your morning with us. We appreciate it. Anytime you connect with us virtually or in person, make sure you check out all of our different social media presence and follow, connect, do all of that with us. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you. Have a great rest of the day and rest of the month, and we'll see you in March. Bye. Bye-bye.